You good to go now? <clears throat> All right. Sorry, everyone. Hope you everyone can hear me now. Um, my name is Morgan E. Slavos. I am the Director of Response and Investment Programs at the GRI. Uh, on stage with me is Stephanie Meyer, uh, who is the Director of Response and Investment at HSBC uh, Global Asset Management. Uh, we've been asked uh, to talk over lunch on the Climate Action 100 um, Initiative, which is an investor initiative uh, to engage systemically important greenhouse gas emitters and other companies across the global economy that have significant opportunities to drive the clean energy transition and help to achieve the Paris uh, Agreement. Investors are engaging with the world's largest companies uh, on their governance and management of climate risks uh, and pushing for enhanced corporate disclosures on these risks. And in particular, investors are engaging companies to implement strong governance frameworks to articulate their accountability and oversight of climate risk, take action to reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions across their value chain and to provide enhanced corporate disclosures along the lines of TCFD. Now, the scale of this initiative actually is quite big and has grown over the last couple of years to uh, involve over 400 investors now uh, with $36 trillion of, of uh, committed assets engaging 161 companies that represent 80% of global uh, industrial emissions. So over the next sort of 30 to 35 minutes, uh, I'm going to ask some questions of uh, Stephanie about her involvement in the Climate Action 100 Plus, um, particularly around um, HSBC's motivation to, uh, to participate in the initiative, um, the real successes, and also what actions are taking place in the Americas. And hopefully, at the end, we'll have a few minutes for uh, um, questions from the audience. So, Stephanie, I'll just start by asking what was your motivation, HSBC's motivations to involve, get involved in Climate Action 100? Um, yes, and thank you very much for um, having me here. Um, at the risk of adding another number to the many numbers we've heard uh, today about the, the risks of climate change, um, I was involved in a report from the Economist Intelligence Unit in 2015 um, that worked out uh, the, the impacts discounted to present day value of what a six degree world would look like. Um, and the number was 43 trillion dollars of assets wiped out um, of the global stock of assets permanently. Now, you can argue that six degrees is at the most extreme end, but sadly, since that report and, and since the Global Climate Agreement in Paris, obviously carbon emissions have continued to, to grow. Um, so now we see climate risk as presenting one of the most significant risks to investors today. Uh, it's systemic, as we've heard, it covers all um, elements of the economy across all, all asset classes. Um, and, and the change that's required um, to, to address this is it's really a seismic change that we need to see, uh, a change in the way that we invest, a change in the way that we do business, uh, the change in the way that we live our, our everyday lives. Um, but the change can also be uh, an opportunity as well. And um, in December 2017, we started some work on, on our own climate scenario risk analysis. And there we found across a range of scenarios, for, with the exception of, of the coal sector, within most sectors, there were some winners as well as the losers. So I think for us, it's really recognizing that, you know, as you outlined, the, the number of companies involved in the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative um, it really is uh, our, our, our duty as investors to take action, to engage with those companies, um, to ensure that they at least stand that chance of being amongst those, those winning companies, not just for the sakes of the investments that we have in those particular companies, but for the impact, as we've heard, that it will have across the, the economy um, more widely. So that's why I'm very pleased to be on the, the steering committee and why um, spent uh, you know the considerable amount of time and, and evening calls on this uh, you know big global initiative to to really um, get the action and the collaboration um, that that you know will play an important part in this transition. I mean, as you've been involved quite deeply in this, and you know, as a member of the steering committee, could you go into a bit of detail around what the objectives of Climate Action One Hundred Plus? Yeah. So as, as you said, we we selected. 
first, uh, the 100 um, largest listed companies by, by emissions. Um, we then added another 61 companies that were identified from the investor base of those, those uh, companies that, that were either strategically at risk or strategically important in terms of achieving um, the, the change, the transition to a low carbon um, economy. Um, and, and it's worth highlighting that those 161 companies now on the focus list represent 8 trillion of, um, of, of AUM, of, of market cap. So this isn't an insignificant size of, of companies we're, we're engaging with. And essentially, yes, the asks, the three asks is, you know, firstly around setting um, in place appropriate governance um, structures. Um, you know, as we know, having that leadership from the top, having a, a framework, having responsibility and accountability is incredibly important in getting any change to, to happen. Um, but the action piece is obviously incredibly important. And again, recognizing that, that this change, these reductions need to happen across the value chain, not just looking at the, you know, the scope one and two, not just looking at the operations, because this is a, a system shift that we're talking about. And then finally, the piece um, which is echoed throughout the day on, on the enhanced disclosure. You know, we as financial institution need to understand and manage climate risks that, that we're exposed to. To do that, we need data. And we heard from NGFS around that data. How do we bridge that data gap um, involved in the task force and climate related financial disclosure recommendations? You know, that is premised on the fact that if we have better information, if we have more consistent information, if we're also able to use it in a, in a structured and appropriate way, then we can start making those, those better decisions, shifting capital, and sending those signals to the market that will help us decarbonize. So those three asks are, are really incredibly um, important. Now, um, I know that the word collaborative engagement has quite an, an industry specific term for, like, I think for, for investors. And I want to ask I think, just quite a basic question to make sure that everyone in the audience is working from the same understanding. But what do we mean by collaborative engagement? I mean, you touched on it briefly, I think, with some of the, the points before, but if you mm -hmm. maybe just tease that. Sure. So, I mean, engagement is essentially, you know, as investors, we have a fiduciary duty to, to look after the assets that we invest on behalf of our clients. For asset owners, responsibility to vest the, the assets on behalf of the end beneficiary. Um, as part of that, and to help you know, maintain and, and enhance the value of the investments, we engage. By engagement, it might mean talking to the board of directors, um, you know, writing to outline our concerns. It's, it's essentially part of, of um, how we ensure companies are, and you know, issuers are acting in a way that we think will preserve um, and ideally enhance the value of what we do. The collaborative piece is we do it with others. So yes, we continue to have those one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with the companies that, that we're shareholders or, or bondholders in. Um, but often, and as we've seen, I think Climate Action 100 Plus is you know, particularly um, a good example of this, is you know, when um, multiple investors come together with a single, or single you know, three asks, a single ask around addressing climate risk and three specific requirements, it, it shifts. It shifts the, the within company boards the recognition that, that this isn't just a, a niche interest of a few investors. That this is actually the financial system talking, um, and it and it and it really um, helps to to create that momentum um, and that 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 change that, that we need to see. So then, why is it so important for, and useful to HCC to make sure to engage? So we've outlined the sort of systemic risks and the challenges of us not transitioning to a, to a low, um, lower carbon economy. And again, as long-term investors, we, we see that longer time horizon. But perhaps more granularly, we see engagement as part of the investment process. So, you know, alongside integrating environmental, social and governance data, you know, the more specific climate risk data, the way that we um, check that data, get more information is by engaging. The way that we reassure ourselves or not that companies are actually taking the appropriate steps to manage those climate risks is through engagement. So, yes, we have dedicated stewardship teams, but it's something that every analyst and every portfolio manager is, in, is, is engaged in. It's part of the investment process. And that's why it's valuable to us 
from an investment perspective, it's it's obviously uh, valuable to us from a, a sort of systemic market risk um, perspective as well. Yeah. Can I just talk about your integration just slightly here in terms of what are some of the challenges that I think that you face over your time there in terms of integrating or from your experience trying to integrate ESG in, into the process and practices and, and stewardship or activities of HSBC or or any sort of firm that you've involved in? Um, there's a number of challenges. So it's one is the you know data availability, which is again we've we've talked about a number of um, times. It's also prioritisation. I mean you know we own seven thousand, ten thousand companies. How how do you decide what are those you know either you know your largest holdings, the the, the highest risk. Or the companies with the highest risk exposure, um, you know, those that you hold actively versus those that, that you hold through indices, you know, how do you best affect that change? Um, that's another reason why collaborative engagement is very valuable because, you know, these the engagements that are being undertaken, as we can see, they're, they're about entire sort of business model shifts. This isn't a sort of please can you put in place, um, you know, a health and safety policy for which there's you know, a, a long established uh, mechanism and international standards about how you do that. It's, a, it's about, you know, is your business resilient now and will it be resilient in the future to climate risk? We don't have the pro forma of what that looks like. It's a detailed conversation and discussion, which takes time, which is why something like Climate Action 100 Plus is so important because it means, you know, there are lead investors, there are supporting investors, you know, again, ideally, those placed in the market are best placed um, to, to have those conversations. Um, so that's another another one of the, the elements. Now, just shifting on uh, onto the, we talked about the process, the objectives, and how you've gone about it. Can you give some examples of the, of the initial successes to date, and some any particular companies, for instance, that mm -hmm. um, have been a real success so far? Yeah, certainly. So actually, in um, October, so a few months ago, we uh, released our first. Uh, progress report. So I'm happy to add that to the pack <laughs> that will be circulated. Um, it's over 100 pages, partly because once we started, we realised there's quite a lot we need to explain. There's quite a lot of uh, sector specific sort of um, details that it, it helps to have to contextualise the win. But I think, you know, while we've seen progress across all three, so across governance, across uh, you know, setting targets and across the disclosure, so, you know, companies signing up to, to TCFD um, aligned disclosure. I think the, the, the area that I'm most excited about and I think is most meaningful is we've started to see these net zero um, targets by companies, uh, companies in, you know, sectors like oil and gas. So we've had Repsol in the last few days come out and, and, and make a net zero um, targets again, not just from their operations, but also recognizing the impact of their of their products. Um, you know, we've seen that in you know Vale, mining company that that has a lot of issues that it needs to focus on, and yet it has also set these net zero targets. And we've seen that echoed across a lot of you know the other hard to bait sectors, whether it's you know Qantas for airlines or Heidelberg Cement in the cement sector. Um, now. You know, the details of that, what net zero and how they're going to get to it, is critical. The time frame, again, most of those targets are by 2050. And, you know, as we've seen, that time frame needs to come forward. But the fact that we're seeing sectors that have either um, said that actually their business model is fine for the next, you know, coming decades, or that it's too hard to abate certain sectors, they're actually coming out and saying, we recognize that we need to shift. So we are setting ourselves ambitious targets. I think is incredibly important in shifting that whole um, I suppose, you know, mindset and ultimately the market of, of how companies and you know real economy are going to act and respond. So how, are you, how are you going about getting those, um, those you know, driving ambition targets with specific companies, is it led from a lead, uh, lead investor or is it a subgroup within the initiative going and doing that or how, how is it going, how is it coming about? Yeah, so as, as all signatories essentially need to um, lead, sign up to lead on at least one one company and, and we encourage those leads to be from within the market because you know that engagement tends to be most effective where um, the investor is much more familiar with, with the company, with the operating environment uh, and regulatory environment that that company is operating in. But, but there's then a you know, reasonably large cohort of supporting investors that will 
be there in the collaborative engagement meeting. So you know, there may, may be you know, eight investors around the table with the senior um, uh, management of, of particular companies debating quite specific you know, issues around are they going to link their, their um, remuneration to, to climate targets? What are those climate targets going to be? How are they going to ensure that um, the, not just their own lobbying in terms of progressive climate policy, but, but that of their trade associations is aligned to ensure that, you know, when they say as the CEO stands up and says um, that, you know, they welcome the Paris Agreement, um, they're not then inadvertently supporting trade associations that are trying to undermine the ratcheting of, of climate policy. Um, so again, that's, that's part of that, that dialogue and bringing those different perspectives um, is really important. So you talk about then having, I suppose, regional leads and regional contexts within the, the Latin American, um, I think, region. Have, has there been any action by Climate Action 100 Plus in the area? And if so, what are those some of those examples and what are the successes? Yeah, so I think we've seen, and again, it's important to emphasise this as a, a global initiative, both in terms of the, the companies and the signatory base. So I think companies are into 33 markets, investor signatories in you know 28 markets. So this is a global initiative, and clearly not every market has the same um, the same history, the same experience of, of engagement um, others do. So we've seen obviously in, in Europe and North America where there's been more of that, we've seen and, and in many cases, you know, building on multiple years of engagement, we've seen some of those sort of company um, wins come sooner. Um, in, in Asia, we formed a separate working group um, to help understand those market um, specifics. Um, in Latin America, we, the, there's been some good progress recently in terms of establishing that engagement. And again, one of the benefits of the initiative is how can we help um, share that learning from investors in, in one region to another, from investors that are focused on you know, a company in, in, a, in a, you know, the oil and gas, gas sector in um, uh, you know, in North America, in Europe, in, in Latin America, what does that what does that look like, and how can that help build build capacity? So I'd, I'd say it's it's um, been slightly slow to start in Latin America, but I think there's um, there's huge scope um, and, and certainly increasing appetite to um, to, to to get really um, engaged on, on that. Are these specific companies that have been engaged in, in, in Latin America at the Yeah, so we mentioned Vale, it's one of the, the companies. Um, Semex, again, Semex is interesting because we've had the, the Heidelberg Cement announcement around net zero. So again, you see that sort of peer dynamic of, well, if one leading company thinks it might be possible, you know, what are the conditions for that and how might it be possible um, for, for another, you know, leading company in the same, uh, in the same uh, sector? Um, so, so yeah, Petrobras again. You know, we've we've looked at you. Know, we've you know we're seeing a number of uh, uh, targets being announced by oil and gas companies now. Clearly, you know where there's more um, state ownership, there's another challenge or dynamic to to an engagement. Um, but but no, we've seen some uh, certainly some some good initial conversations between investors and and, and boards um, in in the region. Yeah. And just I think on some of those, I think, had there been, I think, you talked about, I suppose, SOEs, um, I think, had there been challenges in some of the political environment sometimes, or is it, how, do, how, do, how do investors deal with, with those types of situations? I think, I mean, of this, you know, a number of you have been working and doing academic studies in this area, I've seen that clearly when you're looking at the different um, transition scenarios, you know, policy is, is one of those key elements that determines how, you know, how far, how fast which sectors um, are going to you know, succeed or, or suffer. And so I think recognising the importance of the, you know, the market specific or the region specific policy context is, is, really, um, it is really important. And obviously with state-owned enterprises, it's, much, it's, it's even more, um, I think, relevant to look at the, you know, the national context of you know, where are the NDCs, how ambitious are they, what are the plans for ratcheting or not. How granular are those policy measures in terms of sector by sector um, uh, policy measures? How much um, transparency is there around that or, or already for, for the companies? Because again, for them to transition, they want to recognise or they want to feel that you know it's um, is at pace 
or slightly ahead of where regulation is, not miles ahead, which is again why, um, you know, separately from the initiative, but sort of the, the policy um, uh, perspective is so, is so important. Yeah. Um, so we talked about some of the regional challenges, um, but what other challenges do you think, we're, I mean, I mean we, we're trying to, I suppose, painting a bit of a picture of there's been a lot of successes, but what are the challenges also we're seeing when we're ahead of us? Um, as the initiative goes into its next few years? Yeah, so I mean, as we said, there's been a lot of progress, but it's not it's not enough and it's not fast enough. So I think it's, it's important to recognise successes because, again, I think they provide sort of beacons to see what's possible. Um, but again, if you're going to, you know, if we're going to shift entire economies, entire sectors, you know, we need to do more and we need to do it quicker. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's certainly challenges around how do we how do we get that shift to happen um, you know, across more sectors, um, you know, more consistently. And and I think increasingly this whole how do we raise the bar globally um it is really important because again having um a very sort of you know, a, one element of a disruptive transition is one where you have all sorts of you know adjustment issues because of high tax you know carbon tax it, and that may not be explicit but sort of implicit carbon costs in one area versus another area and and need to recognize what those barriers are and i think the other element which is perhaps underestimated is that you know it's, it's people making changes it's it's boards, it's it's people sitting around a table trying to, you know, coming to the conclusion that the way they've always done things is not going to work. So they need to do something different. And they don't necessarily know what that different needs to be. Or they've got, you know, one pocket of their business that looks like they have quite a good handle on what they're doing. But what does that mean for the, you know, the rest of the business? And so, you know, that's why the engagement is, uh, is more of a, an art. Um, based on data and you know research and analysis, but it's essentially a um, you know a, a meeting of minds of what needs to happen. So we talked about the challenges and I think speed and I think you touched on some of these already. But then I suppose what are the enablers then to help speed up the process and, and help us achieve the targets? Yeah, so I think you know again from from the sort of investor perspective, I think one of the enablers is the fact that we now have this, you know, this global initiative where there's a lot of information sharing, knowledge sharing, um, you know, but specifically within sectors around what's possible and, and what we've seen others um, others doing as well as some of that kind of practice piece. I think another big enabler is actually we're seeing here, you know, regulators, supervisors bringing that focus to bear on on investors. It's OK, well, how are we managing climate risk? Okay, well, to, to be able to do that, we need to understand what our investee companies are, are doing. Um, and, you know, one of the things that perhaps hasn't been brought out so much in some of the academic studies I've had so far, although I've seen that there's, there's a lot more to come, um, is really this, this concept of, you know, yes, there's, you know, brown and green or more carbon intensive, less carbon intensive, however you want to classify it. But the real, I mean, for me, that shift is if you make the brown green you know if, if as investors we help companies transition to be you know net zero to to, to start um you know producing the the technology that we need to, to continue to fuel our, our low carbon transition um so it's it's that dynamic element which is hard to quantify and and but but it's incredibly important because we're not just gonna our economy today will still be you know, in part made of companies that are here now. I mean, certainly not totally, but we will we will see those shift and those that are, you know, that aren't keeping pace will not be here in 10, 20 years. But some of them are. So if you are, which of those companies that are going to transition, that are going to continue to survive, that are going to be there for, you know, the next 150 years? Um, so I think that's, that's really, I know, I find that sort of part of the exciting, um, positive enabling part. Yeah. Now, so we didn't talk about this question before we got up here, but uh, we talk a lot about the transition um, risk, and obviously it's captured a lot in sort of financial terms. But does the initiative also capture off the people side in terms of the, the just transition that is often talked about? I'm wondering if that was part of the discussions in, with, with the engagement and with companies. Yes, definitely. So, I mean, essentially, that second piece around a second goal around the you know reduction in line with Paris. I mean, Paris is very explicit about it being just transition. Um, it's also explicit about the kind of 
the the ambition for the 1.5 rather than the two because again depending on where you know where you pitch the target it directly impacts the action that needs to to happen um so yes i mean the tra just transition again there's lots of great work that you know nick robbins and lt are, are doing on this space but again i think what you're seeing is uh, companies were involved in sectors that that have a very sort of deep community impact and can't be you know repurposed in in the same way are recognizing that they need to engage with governments around what that transition looks like um, you know what is that 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 share between the company and the and the you know the government how can we fund that transition so it's actually one where you see the you know, the, the Green New Deals, the green economy, the new jobs from the new economy while recognising that, you know, sadly those, those um, uh, sort of skill sets don't necessarily immediately overlap. So how do you retrain? How do you, how do you preserve communities if the main thing that they've been doing is something that's going to stop happening? I guess the question, I suppose, is before we hand over to the uh, audience for some questions, is what next and what are the priorities for the initiative next year? So, and I think obviously it's an exciting time also coming up to then the COP26 next year. It's sort of the ratcheting point of kind of stock take. Where are we? I think, again, this, this sort of net zero piece has, has gained momentum. And I think if that can continue to gain momentum in terms of the, you know, the sectors and the numbers of companies that are making those commitments, and then importantly, the granularity of how that's actually going to be achieved, that will continue to be a big focus. I mean, the second one is really, again, the, this lobbying piece. You know, we know how critical climate policy is. So how do we ensure that actually, you know, as investors, we're interested in, you know, progressive policy to enable a smooth transition? How do we ensure that the companies we're investing in are also um, pushing for that same thing? And then, you know, finally, it's the how do we engage more um, signatories in the Climate Action 100 Plus? And so, you know, excited to think through, you know, what is that role within, um, you know, Latin America? What can we do to sort of catalyze that same, um, that same shift? Because I, I really do um, see that, that you know, investors, you know, can and, and, and need to be part of uh, supporting and, um, cajoling in some cases companies to to be making that transition well i think we'll leave it there in terms of my questions and actually give it the chance for the audience to ask any questions they might have of, of stephanie and of climate action 100 plus right Is there a mic? do you have a microphone <coughs> I can repeat it. Okay, if you want. okay. No, just uh, fantastic, Stephanie. Thank you very, very, very much for accepting to come. I mean, it's um, it's um, um, it's it's very clear from what you are saying that um, this uh, engagement methodology that you explained, yeah. which is really something that we should not take for granted. I mean, we're not not in, not none of us probably in this. Uh, in this uh, lunch, are have the the wisdom and know how to engage and, and uh, how to affect change. You know, and so I think I think um, um, it's it's impressive the the successes you already have. You know, uh, some of them have been very very public. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we, many of us uh, I, I didn't know anything about climate action 100 plus one year ago. And, and suddenly climate action appears in the middle of, of a fundamental transformation, which is, of course, institutional investors. And even Stefano, before launch, was emphasizing the role of, of uh, funds no? and the, 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 the big uh, stake at risk that you have. And that's, that's, that's sort of the motivation for, for action. And uh, it's, um, I think, um, uh, to be honest, for coming from an emerging market, um, uh, all I want is to see how we can, how you could transfer your technology to Mexico, to Latin America, and uh, and uh, um, Alba next to me. No, she is also, of course, a super enthusiast of, of learning about this this uh, transfer of technology, how to engage with companies, 
to, so how to avoid, you know, the typical, like, oh, you're trying to screw me. No, um, sorry to be that long. No, uh, um, uh, and to, to understand that we are all partners in this, no? And that you are a partner to this company because yeah, these guys are not seeing something that you are seeing. Okay. You see, I mean, and, and, and I think, I think, um, um, I, what I what I would really wish, and there are in this audience, there are several multilaterals. Next to me is IFC, IDB. You know, uh, CAF is also so um, that has a very strong regional presence. And so, so I just wanted to ask you how you know how can we uh, make this not only a one-time conversation, no? And so, how can we start and? Uh, there are several, I'm, I'm coming from the central bank, so I'm not the perfect person to speak about it. Yeah. So, but uh, uh, because this is a private led initiative. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but, but how, how, you know, I mean, your, your thoughts, I, I, I know that, that you were already answering a, a little bit that question, but I don't know if you can sort of give us a little bit more of the punch. Yeah, so, I mean, perhaps from a, um, I mean, perhaps perspective, it's worth saying that the initiative is essentially led by five, investor organizations um, focused on climate and one global investor um, uh, organization. So it's uh, the, the PRI is, is one of those um, uh, one of those sort of founding organizations. Um, and then obviously there's the five um, investor representatives and, and I'm one of one of those. I think we've seen a huge increase in PRI signatories in, in the region and I think that would be that's a perfect platform. To organise specific, you know, outreach either in person <laughs> events or certainly webinars. I can, you know, I can do a webinar in, in January. We can set it up and do that if, if, if you know, kind of help convene the right people to to, um, to 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 be part of that. Because I think, you know, just as you say, the more that we <coughs> exchange, um, you know, views, ideas, I think, you know, it, we we can find a way to embed that and transfer that and 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 find a way to. You know, again, had even more of a of an impact. So, you know, I very much welcome um, that. You know, those thoughts, and, and very happy to come back with some more concrete, um, you know, steps forward. Really, I can just talk about uh, our role as PRI in terms of, like, on the operational side, we run the Secretariat for Climate Action Hundred Plus, essentially from London with people around the world as a, as a secretary, and we have a separate Secretariat for the Asia region because it, it is so unique. So we run a different model for different areas to try and, and foster that mm -hmm. engagement. And um, as that initiative looks to expand, there's no, we need to think about how we then service and provide the support for different regions, particularly as our signature, as our signature base grows yeah. and to meet those requirements and needs for, for, for people in the, in the, in the region. Yeah. Yes. So if I understood correctly, you were saying that uh, an important pillar of your work is uh, disclosure of uh, climate change yeah. risks. But the question is, given the uncertainty, how do you actually even identify what are those risks? And then, of course, do you care how do you disclose it? So we look at... Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the question was, we asked for climate risk disclosure. How can we, given that there's so much uncertainty around this area? So my response is that we, we use the TCFD um, disclosure framework, which, again, has some you know concrete elements they can respond and should be able to respond on now. You know. Is there someone who's specifically accountable? How does an organisation um, manage those risks? You know, what metrics are, are, um, are you know, is it collecting? How, what targets is it setting? And the, the scenario stress testing piece is particularly um, interesting because, again, I think as with, you know, amongst the sort of central banking community of working out, you know, should there be one approach or, or many? Should there be a framework, principles based? Should there be specific? Or multiple stress tests, how global versus region specific do they need to be? That's exactly the conversation that's happening amongst um, you know asset owners and asset, asset managers is what do we want that disclosure to look like? Now we already have scenario based disclosure from you know a, a large number of mainly oil and gas or extractor companies that have always had scenario outlooks. They have a, a deep um, there's history of that if you think back to the shell scenarios that have been going on since the 1970s but one of the challenges is you know one how do we better understand if not a consistent scenario at least the consistent scenario assumptions to be able to challenge 
the disclosure that we get because so far all the disclosure has been uh, it'll be fine and like well the more we get and if they all say we'll be fine they can't all be right so we need to again you know challenge and interrogate that disclosure ensure that the you know the assumptions and the scenarios are sufficiently um, uh, you know robust and that's one of the, the reasons that um, we're also engaging with the um, international energy agency because a lot of the scenarios that are used are the IEA scenarios and while they've um, you know in their latest one came out and said that they are working towards what a 1.5 would look like we know the reference scenarios are incredibly important and you know within them there's a huge variety of um, you know assumptions about proportion of renewable energy that might be there you know the role of, of carbon capture or any you know negative emissions technology those things matter those things are between meeting two degree targets and not so again i think the, the over time you know we are and very quickly we are going to need to get into that level of detail but already with the disclosure that we're asking for the tcfd aligned you get a good idea of those companies that are seriously engaging in the question and those that haven't even started and that's a concern obviously thank you yes yeah. I, I, I want to be a, a little bit challenging. Um, first of all, um, the, the, the work, kind of one action, action 100 is really amazing. Um, the challenging piece is um, when you think about portfolios, not investing in real assets, but equities and debt portfolios. Mm -hmm which are most of the big chunk of the portfolios of institutional uh, investors and asset owners. Um, we're talking about basically um, ownership transfer, right? If I divest from this portfolio, there's enough liquidity in the market right now, someone else will pick it up. Now, if you think about, if we think about um, investment in SDGs, which are highly needed in, in all the development uh, and um, uh, you think about the seven trillion number. Um, have you been doing any work to to try to understand how this engagement eventually translates into um, investments in, in in real assets? Because the seven trillion number gap for SDGs is seven trillion investment in real economy. So perhaps if I pick that apart a bit, I think one of the reasons that we focus on the engagement rather than the divestment is because, you know, we think one, as owners, you have an opportunity to influence and change. And two, there is a risk if a more responsible owner sells that it gets, you know, bought up by someone that, that doesn't challenge the, the company. In terms of the point of how do we actually get that transfer into the real, you know, the real assets and real economy, I think there's two elements. I think within listed markets, it's about, you know, where is the capex for that company um, company going? And, and some of the shareholder resolution um, that was filed at, at BP, one of the key questions there is, you know, how can you show us that the capex is aligned with two, two degrees? Now, there's a lot of detail and you know definitions you need within that but the point is okay so where are those listed asset you know those listed issuers where are they putting their their capital i think outside of the listed asset class i think increasingly well i know increasingly asset managers and asset owners are looking at well how do we create that impact so you know we've done some work with the um the ifc again if i'm looking at, at how do you invest in green bonds and how do you grow the green bond market in emerging markets in the real economy we've seen a, you know we see dramatic growth dramatic growth particularly in um you know financial um, sector issuance but how do you get you know the real economy companies to be issuing you know green bonds to to finance things uh, to finance the kind of infrastructure the kinds of um you know energy efficiency that that, that we need so partly it's an indirect way if we're only talking about the listed assets but the more that investors engage in the challenges of the listed world and what that means, you know, even if we get all listed assets to do what they need to do, we still have, as you've highlighted, massive need for infrastructure 
um, that, that, that that's not going to meet. So actually you're seeing a lot of Athenians starting to allocate specifically to green assets. How do we classify green, going back to that issue around taxonomy? So it's also an aware, awareness raising piece. So you're completely right to, to challenge that. This is not the solution for everything, but it's an incredibly important part, I think, of shifting that system and, and getting us to decarbonize the economy. So have, have you been able to, to increasingly track what you were mentioning, for example, about the uh, BP? So how, how so then come, to, that, in, that was a, a resolution that was filed in April last, oh, well, no, sorry, this year. So next year, the April, they're coming back with a report, at which point we will need to see whether what they've committed to, or what they've done, or how they've changed meets those requirements or not. So, so it's part of that dialogue, it's part of the ask, the aligning of the CapEx. Have we seen the CapEx sh shift? Not yet, but again, that's part of the disclosure that we expect to see. Um, because again, it's part of how do you, if, if you're telling me you're managing this as a risk, you're, you should be investing in the right things. So what, what are the things that are going to make your business resilient for the future? So we should start seeing that disclosure and CapEx going forward. Thank you very much. Carlos Arano from IFC World Bank Group. And more than a question is sharing with you and with the audience some, uh, some very interesting figures that came very recently to the market. And that at the end of the day, give us the sense of urgency and that we need to do much more. And this is the, I want to share a couple ideas on the climate poli policy initiative, the latest report published this month of November about the global landscape of climate finance, mm -hmm. which gives a picture of the money that is being put on the table to change to a more sustainable uh, <clears throat> economic model. And the picture is not good. The picture is not good at all, because as we have been discussing this morning, in order to keep the increase of temperature below the, not the, two, not the, not the one grade and a half, ideally, but two, two degrees, we would need to, we're investing around 600 billion, 600 billion a year, and the, and the target is 3.8 trillion. So the gap is enormous, it's huge. We are late and we are short. And who's putting the money, the green money to the table right now? No, the banks. We need to do much more. Multilaterals and commercial bankings are marginal. You know who's putting the money, the green money, to change the model out of this 600 billion? The corporate private sector mainly, number one, and followed by the national development banks. And money it does, is not flowing cross-border. Money raised locally is invested locally. So the market is very small for climate finance, highly concentrated, 93% of all the green money on the table it still goes to financing renewable projects. It's not financing agriculture, it's not financing water, and, and, most, of it, and most of it is concentrated in mitigation. Very, very, very little is being done doing in adaptation to handle the effects, the negative effects of what is happening. So my point here is this, this looks very bad. Doesn't look good at all. We cannot be pleasant with ourselves. We have a major role to play the private sector. The government is not going to, to take us out of this picture. It's a private sector and within the private sector, the financial institution, we have a core role that we are not doing. We need to put our client out of fossil fuels, thank you very much. Uh, and we cannot be cynic about it. Yeah. We cannot be in one hand financing green and in the other hand financing fiscal. We need to move more urgently. We are doing that at the multilateral levels. We are investing, investing out of clients that are financing carbon and coal. So this is urgent, the picture doesn't look nice, and uh, perhaps we can have a session to, to, to give an in-depth view to the landscape of climate finance because it is worth it. So, and I think we have a major responsibility the financial institutions. I don't know if it's the time. Stiffy, do you want a chance to respond to that? Or if 
perhaps is the right moment to transition it out of yes. lunch and save that for some, <laughs> save yeah. those uh, questions right. for the uh, well, the, 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 bank, the, the banking policy panel later in the afternoon. Yes, <laughs> I think very well. I I would completely agree in terms of that gap, and I think there's a lot of opportunity. Again, you know, finance is different from investment, and I think we need to recognise what those two things can do and what they need to do. And and one of the things I've been keen to talk about is is you know what investors can do and yes investors in terms of you know where you choose to put your your capital for asset owners completely for asset managers we're investing on on behalf of of a, of a mandate so what can we do and engagement is incredibly powerful um thing activity that we can undertake to help shift that system and so i'm you know looking forward to more regional um collaboration on on this area so with that, I think we're out of time. It just leaves me to thank you, Stephanie, for your wonderful thank insights. You. <laughs> so join me in thanking you.